It's Saturday night. It's almost live. And it's right up a big tower in London's Westminster. It's Sam Delaney's News Thing. Joining Sam this week, here comes the hot stepper, it's Simon Evans. He's the lyrical gangster, Aisha Hazarika. Excuse me, Mr. Officer, he's coming on like that. It's Alfie Moore. On today's show, Hitler, Himmler, Hess, Livingston, question mark? Hello, 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 what we got here then? Fuck me, it's finally the truth. And our special guest, Labor MP, well, at least she still was last time we checked. Rupa Huck. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me, panel. Uh, right, we currently exist under the yoke of the most radical government in generations. An insane cabal of manic ideologues intent on grinding the country into the ground so they can sell it off cheap to their mates. At a time like this, who should we turn to to protect us? Her Majesty's opposition, of course, but unfortunately... Her Majesty's opposition are too busy to do anything about it right now. Too busy being racist. The news in racism. That's right, racism's back. It used to be easy to tell who was racist in British politics. It was the Tories. Labour always seemed a bit shifty, but pretty much OK. But now it turns out they were anti-Semites all along. So basically, it looks like we're probably all racist now. It all started on Wednesday when Jeremy Corbyn failed to react when old Facebook posts were unearthed from Labour MP Naz Shah suggesting the Israeli population should be shipped to the United States. Mate, you cannot just have obscure backbench MPs mouthing off about deporting the Jews and act like it's just bants. That's the kind of laissez-faire mismanagement that's undone UKIP. If you don't lock this shit down, then within a week you'll have Harriet Harman on Question Time <laughs> raving about bongo bongo land and claiming that Indian people smell of curry. <laughs> Anyway, that was just the half of it. Ken Livingston appeared on radio the next day and launched a defence of Naz Shah that started out quite well, until this happened. Let's remember, when Hitler won his election in 1932, his policy then was that Jews should be moved to Israel. He was supporting um, Zionism. His boy went mad and ended up killing six million Jews. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Ken, a discussion about rampant anti-Semitism in the Labour Party is not the best place to start reassessing the early works <laughs> of Hitler. It doesn't matter how intelligent and socially conscious his first album was, Adolf Hitler is not the Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> it wasn't the best start to the day for Ken. Then an hour later, he bumped into his colleague, John Mann, on his way into the BBC. Disgusting racist. Oh, Rewriting the history, no, no. you're a disgusting well, racist. You say it's not true. You're, yes, you're a lying racist. Really? Why don't you go and check Nazi history? apologist. Check a Nazi history. apologist. A Nazi apologist. You're a disgusting Nazi apologist, Livingstone. Quite impressive. He doesn't even flinch when man starts shouting at him. And he's in the middle of a radio interview on his mobile at the time. Pretty smooth. This is basically what his life must be like all the time, mind you, walking around Westminster, giving radio interviews on the phone while his colleagues shout Nazi apologists at him. <laughs> so why has Labour now gone all racist? Seems like a pretty ballsy rebrand. But more likely, it's just a failure of leadership. Corbyn should have snuffed this out much sooner. Basically, he's like that really nice geography teacher that tries to be everyone's mate, and one day he walks into the classroom and they've broken into his desk, pulled out all the files and done a shit on the computer. And that's when he has a nervous breakdown. <laughs> but this is far less exciting than that. Corbyn's only been in charge for 10 months and he's turned the party that built most of what's great about modern Britain into the political equivalent of a turd on a mouse mat. Aisha, you worked for the Labour Party. What is it about not being anti-Semitic that they can't get their heads around? The thing with this stuff, right, is you have to have a zero tolerance policy on it because the minute you start letting something slide, a kind of culture builds up. If you're going to have a policy which is anti-racism and anti-discrimination, you have to be pretty firm and swift and clear from the leadership that this is not OK, because that is how kind of bad kind of cultural stuff starts. And that is what the Labour Party... We have fought really, really hard. One of the proudest things about the Labour tradition is what we did in this country on making the country more equal, more fair, fighting prejudice, discrimination, all that kind of thing. That is, like, our, in our DNA. With a party, though, so, like, the problem is there are all sorts of nuances and complexities, <laughs> but the point is, is that you have to be quite firm 
firm and clear yeah. as a political leader, shut that shit down and say, let's focus Lock on it fighting down the government. quickly and not let this turn into, like, the massive, like, well, drama that's clearly the main point, is that Labour couldn't have picked their moment. I mean, it's extraordinary. And obviously, they've been sabotaged to some extent by the release of this Facebook post from two years ago. It's yeah. been time to, in order to interfere with the elections. But the degree to which Labour has allowed that to escalate is absolutely extraordinary. It's like having an attack, a guard dog, that as soon as the premises is built in broken into, it starts chasing its own tail. It's just extraordinary. Ken Livingston going on and sort of trying to almost defend Hitler's early work by going, you know, he had a kind of point of view, then he went a bit mad and killed six million people, uh, right? Uh, there's uh, kind was, of having, yeah. like, a sort of Michael Down falling down, Michael yeah, Douglas yeah. falling uh, down. Uh, then there's... I mean, uh, you can't condone that type of language. Alfie, there's been strong condemnation of Ken from all quarters. But actually, isn't he a, a bit like a daft racist nana who we should all ignore and sympathise with? <laughs> to, to a degree, and, and I, I would say it's a lot to do with interpretation. Uh, of course, bad call, obviously, mentioning somebody like Hitler. And I, I don't really get it anyway. Somebody because... like <laughs> Hitler. <laughs> There's no one else like him. <laughs> he was a one in a million. Was he a bit of a one off, you think? <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I thought it was lovely the way he reminded us that he did win an election in 1920. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I thought that put things into perspective. Yeah. Now, yeah. Labour hasn't won one of those for a while. It's interesting, it's interesting that he should just sort of unprompted think. Maybe now would be a good time <laughs> to make a Hitler analogy. Is yes. there ever a good time to make a Hitler analogy? But that analogy was, I am, I am supporting... Hitler was supporting Zionism by sending people away. So, so it's like us supporting Syrian refugees by saying we don't want you in this country, go away. That's not really you, supporting anyway, is it? The thing that I find extraordinary, right, I don't know what possessed him to then think, right, we've got a really bad situation already, now I'm going to steam out and, like, bring Hitler into it. Thanks, panel. Now, this week, we found out at last what we already knew, that 1989's Hillsborough disaster was called by police negligence and subsequently covered up for 27 years <coughs> by the police themselves, the establishment and the Murdoch press. The policeman in charge of the match and one of the architects of the cover-up, Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield, shocked everyone at the inquest by not lying for the first time in 30 years. <laughs> finally admitting the fans weren't to blame for being horribly crushed to death. People say the police tactics were terrible, but their tactics afterwards in covering up the truth were like a well-oiled machine, so credit where credit's due. They even got the great British press to swallow their bullshit. And the Murdoch papers didn't just repeat the lies, they put them in a short skirt, slapped on some rouge and took them out dogging. This was the Sun's front page just a couple of days after the tragedy which was a bit like running a front page on September the 12th, 2001, like this. The truth. Some victims looted stationary cupboards. Some victims scribbled on desks. Some victims left dirty mugs in the kitchen sink. Probably the most depressing thing about all these cover-ups is they keep on happening. The banks, Savile, the Panama Papers, the Iraq War, all of this shit is stuff that happened years ago. And at this rate, we won't find out how they're fucking us over right now for another 30 years. Where are the lions amongst us? Where is the spirit of the poll tax riots? Are we so hypnotised by X Factor and iPhones? We read the news on our phones about our greatest trusted institutions being utterly corrupt and we think to ourselves, fuck me. This 4G is amazing. Maybe I should get an Apple Watch. Well, when the NHS is gone, a watch monitoring your heart rate is the nearest you'll get to a fucking doctor. <laughs> Alfie, you used to be a copper. How come none of the force came clean about what happened the very next day? OK, I ought to say that I am technically still a copper. OK. Although probably not when this show ends. <laughs> but, uh, I, uh... How come the force never came clean? Well, well, all those coppers who saw what's happening, you would have thought they might have come out and said, yeah, this is an absolute bloody mess. Yeah, but it would be very disrespectful for me to even try and defend the police, I think. I, I think that uh, after 27 years, they, the people in court, the families, they deserve their, their small victory, which was uh, we, we heard about this week. I think there is a cultural problem 
And I don't... I mean, saying all the police of this or all the police of that is the same bigotry we, we've been talking well, about no, in other Not stuff. in the case of those South Yorkshire police who were involved in the Hillsborough disaster. It's not bigotry. They uh, all were complicit in a cover-up for 27 years. Well, well firstly... That's I, a matter of fact, isn't it? No, firstly, I would oh, say no. that they were ordinary people, the, the paramedics and, and the cops that went to work, mm. and they went... Yeah. And I should imagine they were very traumatised mm. by that experience for the rest of their lives. So they're the ordinary people... Uh, when but you... they were complicit in the cover-up subsequent to that, weren't they? Well, that's, I'm sorry, you can't say that. You don't know that any of these individuals well, none of were them came aware forward, of it. Though, to the no, press but that's or not, and that. that's not an indication of complicity. That might be an indication that they haven't got a helicopter view of what happened. Oh, one no, man knows that he ordered the gates open. They might have been standing in one report, part of the ground. Okay, if you, you read the report, that. anyone who it's was outrageous to say that these policemen were in complicit. Simon, in the read the report. Everyone who was there, who every single policeman knew what was going on in every part of the. OK, all right, fair enough. But if you read the report, you will see that most people who were there, anyone who was a witness to it, saw exactly what was going on. But perhaps the police were unaware. You're it's... right. I apologise, South Yorkshire Police Force. Simon Evans has leapt you've to your defence. You've, in, got, to, you've in, got to define which parts of the police force are to blame for this. Otherwise, yes. you just say all pigs are bastards. The, the point, and you might as the well point go back I'm to the making 70s. is the police who were there that day, 20, for 27 years, no one came forward and gave and... any different point of view. And That's I'm, just I'm, a fact. I would say we're talking about a cultural thing. Now, I first joined the police. I've been in the police twice. I first joined the police in 1987. So I, w I was in the police at that time. I think the culture has improved, yeah. but uh, it was a culture of... I got bollocked to death in the police when I, when I first joined in 1987. Everybody was frightened to make mistakes, and that was a culture. And I think... This is the big issue that, that will come out over the coming uh, years. Can I come in? Because I, I totally understand, you, you know, you've been a policeman. You were not sort of saying all police people are kind of tarnished on this. But if you are someone like Margaret Aspinall, if you are like one of the, the, the parents of children who died, you would want to ask the question. Of course. If, you know, of course. like, could, why, wouldn't, why didn't somebody come forward? And it's not just a sort of slagging off all the police. It's just you can understand why the, the victims and the families have kind of searched for these questions. And probably have asked the question, why didn't right. you yeah. like some of those? Because it wasn't a culture, forward. there wasn't a, an environment which people could could stand up and say, "Oh, I'm sorry," you know, as a lone voice or, or a, a minority, and say, "I'm sorry, I don't agree with what we're doing." Thanks, it wasn't Manon. that culture. We're going to leave it there. Spirited defence of the South Yorkshire Police at Hillsborough. There. Uh, coming up, we'll be examining the seedy underside of Underpan Empire BHS and I'll be talking to one of the only Labour MPs willing to stand up and denounce Naz Shah's disgusting racism. Oh, no, it, not really. It's her mate, Rupert Huck. <laughs> Welcome back. So, now we know the police are corrupt, the establishment lies to us and Labour's full of racists, but it turns out you can't even buy a lampshade or a massive bra these days without handing cash to corporate crooks. A year after being sold off for a quid by business tycoon Sir Philip Green, BHS has gone into administration, putting at risk the pensions of all its employees, not to mention their jobs. A couple of surprises with this story. First off, turns out BHS is still in business. Who knew? If you're under 40, you probably have no idea what BHS is. <laughs> you probably think it's some sort of new designer drug, you bloody idiots. It's not. <laughs> BHS is sort of like Debenhams if Debenhams had contracted TB as a child and now can't stop wheezing and coughing <laughs> stuff up into a bucket. And secondly, Philip Green somehow managed to squeeze 800 million quid out of BHS in the 14 years he was in charge. How do you make that much money out of BHS? The margins on unflattering thin grey underpants must be <laughs> fucking astronomical. <laughs> but credit to Philip Green. He did leave some assets in the company because otherwise there'd be nothing for the new owners to strip out. At least... That's how I see it. Unfortunately, my understanding of BHS's business model is limited to a quick flick through the lingerie section of their catalogue. But someone who understands the murky world of corporate finance is the Daily Mail city editor, Alex Brummer, who joins me now. Alex, do you think Sir Philip Green is currently quaking on his super yacht? Well, I, I don't think he's quaking. I actually talked to him this morning and he sounded, quite, he sounded quite happy when I talked to him this morning. Um, he thinks it'll all blow over and life will go on as it was before. But um, he's got a lot of obstacles to, get, to pass through before life gets back to normal again. To me, it looks like Philip Green and this other bloke just made off with all the money in the firm. So now it's gone bust. They looted it, basically. Is that true? Well, I think looted is rather a strong term. I think that um, he... Uh, <laughs> 
Philip, I think, paid himself a large dividend um, in the first three or four years that he owned the company, which was around about £400 million, which was quite nice, which went off to Monaco, where Lady Tina, his wife, lives and lives on the super yacht or looks after the super yacht. And that happened. And then there was another 11 or £12 million a year, which he charged BHS um, for rental because he'd taken all the properties which BHS, BHS owned into his private companies. And then he'd also charged the management and accounting fees. So you, you totted all of that up. And he took out about £1.2 billion out of BHS. So it wasn't the empty vessel which you described um, at the beginning of the programme. So he's not, as, we, as far as you know, nothing illegal, but a lot that was irresponsible? Well, it's a private company. He could do what he liked with it. He bought it with his own money, and he could take, do what he liked with his own money. I this, think the only problem which has been left behind is that, that 11,000 workers who work for BHS um, had their jobs in jeopardy. And even worse than that, um, the 21,000 people in the BHS pension fund are about £570 million short. Um, and um, that's what will be happening in the coming months. Um, the pensions regulators will be coming after Mr Green and the former owners to try and recover some of that money. At least we can rest assured that Saji Javid will really sort things out here, though, right? Um, well, if he, if he behaves with, towards BHS and is an interventionist with BHS as he was with Tata Steel, we might as well go home. I mean, he's been absolutely hopeless with Tata Steel. If you remember, he was in Australia when that went wrong and they were holding that board meeting and decided to close it down. Then he came back and then about three weeks later, he said, well, we might be willing to put a bit of money into this. Meanwhile, the business is going downhill all the time. So as BHS is concerned, he has the power as the Secretary of State for Business to appoint inspectors, Department of Trade inspectors, to look into what went wrong. And he should have done it by now, and he hasn't done it yet. And you I seem quite he... angry about this, Alex. Do you buy your pyjamas at BHS? Um, I haven't bought anything at BHS for very many years, but I do remember that my late mother used to buy her hats <laughs> there. My nan used to love the canteen. The canteens were very popular. Yeah. They were, and I think they're still, they're still, you know, they're still existing one or two places. I mean, believe it or not, you know, the, the BHS on Oxford Street is still a very busy place. It's a very popular shop. I, I have no idea why, but it is. <laughs> Alex, thanks ever so much for joining us. Panel, uh, we all feel sorry for BHS. Does anyone on the panel feel sorry enough for them to start shopping there, Simon? Well, I have had a coffee in my local BHS quite frequently, actually. Really? Yeah, the, and the, the canteen is still good? there than it is in the Café Nero or Costa opposite in the Churchill Square shopping centre. I will go in BHS. But let me, I'm no let me ask you something. Do they still have those... That when I used to go there with my grandma, they had, like, the metal pot, teapots. And they yeah. scorched your hands. I don't see any sense in those Yeah, that's pots. probably one of the two or three chief reasons, actually. Yeah, I, I mean, it's insane. Dilemmas. Yeah. I don't know why they did and it. And the tiny, annoying little milk one that goes next to it as well. Yeah. You can never get that. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, if you were to put money on it, who do you think is the next big name shop to go under? I'm picking WH Smiths because they look a bit shaky to me. They deserve it if they could for pushing all that chocolate at the till. It's disgraceful. Oh, the jumbo bars. Yeah. 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 It's an Fruit act, milk. act of desperation. Absolutely. And it is, let's be honest, it is drug pusher tactics. It is, isn't it? yeah, yeah. And then there's Argos, of course, oh, uh, Argos. which seems rather outmoded. Everyone loves Argos. Argos still, are like though. the sea facts of shops, aren't they? They should yeah. have been placed yeah, entirely by the everyone internet. Everyone just loves going in and like pressing all the buttons Stealing and all the that pens. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it has gone up market. Uh, thanks, panel. Right, Boris Johnson has said we shouldn't listen to Obama because he's half Kenyan. <laughs> to get to the bottom of this utterly mad outburst, we sent along a man who is one half Canadian. And if that wasn't bad enough, the other half of him is Canadian too. It's Bobby Mayer. Boris Johnson has had his invitation to speak at King's College revoked after saying that President Obama's negative attitude towards the UK was down to some ancestral dislike of the British Empire because he's part Kenyan. Well, Boris, part Kenyan he may be, but you are full asshole. The London mayor was angry because a bust of Winston Churchill was removed from the White House by the president when he took office. Keen to avoid an upset on Obama's recent visit to the UK, David Cameron ensured Downing Street was filled with accessories that he thought would meet with the president's approval, including a commemorative plate of Nelson Mandela, a Martin Luther King bobblehead, and an action figure of Wesley Snipes' blade. 
far as saying Obama hates colonialism, it's strange because Obama is president of the United States. Does the United States colonize countries? No, they just prop up puppet governments to bend smaller countries to their will. They're like the sequel to the British Empire. And like most sequels, they exist because at one time, the original made a lot of money. And Boris is in no position to cast aspersions on anyone's heritage. When he appeared on the BBC's Who Do You Think You Are, he discovered his lineage wasn't quite as English as he suspected. Prince Paul of Württemberg is my great, 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 great grandfather. Yes, seems so. Prince Paul von Württemberg was German and, as it would appear, a bit of a chubby chaser. And as the only known photograph of him shows, the resemblance to Boris is startling. If Boris wants to be PM, then insulting the president is not a good move. That's like taking a shit in the car of a girl you're trying to fuck, then driving that car in complete silence to Sunderland. He's not exactly doing much for that special relationship. Obama and Cameron are, on the surface at least, completely gay for each other. But that's nothing on what Clinton and Blair had. But the biggest love affair of them all was between Reagan and Thatcher. I recently traveled back to 1984, just so I could make the following vulgar remark to them. Hey, Ron! Ronnie! Hey, Ronald! Have you seen her iron box yet? If Boris made it to number 10, the only way that special relationship would be preserved is if Trump were president. They'd be a perfect match. But Boris's PM would be a disaster. At least David Cameron has the decency to get George Osborne and Jeremy Hunt to say the awful things he believes, so we blame them. Boris never passes the cunt baton to the next cunt. He just takes it and runs and runs and runs. Powerful stuff there, Bobby. Time now for my special guest. Now, just before Ken Livingston was sensationally kicked out of the Labour Party for defending Naz Shah, I was lucky enough to sit down with one of his former colleagues, Elin MP Rupa Huck, who also came on to defend Naz Shah. She must be shitting herself right now. <laughs> Let's see what she said. Thank you for coming on the show. You got yourself in a spot of bother uh, defending your uh, sometime colleague, Naz Shah who got suspended this week for sharing anti-Semitic posts on Facebook. Well, I mean, there is an investigation underway, so we shouldn't preempt the results of that. Yeah, well, we know what she did do, which was share a uh, what appeared to be an anti-Semitic um, post on social media. Do you think there's a difference between actually writing something yourself and sharing something? Well, I mean, look, there's no place for anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. We're an anti-racist party, and... Um, this stuff is emerging all the time. I mean, people have shown me some of those posts and they're really quite abhorrent. They made me shudder. Mm. So, I mean, there is no place for that in the Labour Party. There is an investigation. Let's see what... The facts will come out and yeah. let's judge it on you, that. you said in an interview it was easy to click those buttons and that this had become a case of trial by Twitter. So do you, do you feel that that's almost the issue, is that it's more about the perils of social media than it is about the racism involved? Well, we need to see what happened. So, I mean, but yes... But we know what happened, because we saw what she shared, didn't we? I mean, the thing is, I didn't have 100% knowledge of all these things yeah. when I was doing that interview. So yeah. now I've seen some of those things were in her own hand. I mean, I share silly pictures, I think we all do, but, you know... But this, this wasn't looks, silly, this yeah, was racially this offensive, very, wasn't it? Very offensive to many people, um, and that, there's, that's indefensible. So, I mean, mm. she's done the right thing she, uh, by resigning and making that apology. Let's see what comes out of the investigation. Uh, and so you, so you must regret now that you know more about it, because you compared in the interview uh, her post, which offered a solution, a bit of an emotive word, to the Middle East conflict um, to, by relocating Israel to the US. So you compared that to a funny picture you'd posted of Boris Johnson? I mean, to be honest, I've been very preoccupied with issues in Ealing and Acton and Westminster, so I didn't know the entire Twitter history. But, I mean, what I have seen is pretty inexcusable, some of those posts. So it's correct that there is an investigation. Due process has to be done yeah. to investigate. I was talking on a train. Yeah, uh, no, I could hear. Interview. You couldn't hear him properly. I didn't know what he was saying. But, but now um, you know more 
you understand it was you, you are on the record thinks it's in, inexcusable what she posted yeah there's no place posted. for anti-semitism yeah. in our party we believe in a two-state solution that uh, muslims and jews christians everyone can coexist happily in a peaceful israel that's um, our policy the thing is anti-semitism whatever way you look at big problem right now for the labor party though isn't it it's a very serious concern and these things have to be stamped on quickly I'm glad that this investigation is going on about this particular case. The, it, There's a long tradition of... of, of sort Anti-Semitism. Of Jewish <laughs> oh. labour history sort of thing, people... Well, there like, is a there history is of it, but you Jewish can't... Jewish socialist movement. It's hard to point to that when... Because that looks like yeah, you're running forward. away from it. There is a, a number of issues, a proliferation of issues, actually, an instance since Jeremy Corbyn became leader, OK, that, don't, that a lot of people within the party, as well as outside the party, say are not being dealt with by the leadership. Right. So it's great that the Labour Party claimed to have a, a long tradition yeah, of, no, of camaraderie forwards. with Jewish people. But, I mean, that's like, well, we've got black mates, you know? Moving forward, yeah, these things need to be dealt with. I guess the Corbyn team, a year ago, if you'd have said, you know, that guy there having a cup of tea in Portcullis House is going to be the leader this time next year, nobody would have believed you. So, no. I mean, maybe... Some of those systems and professional whatever entourages weren't yeah. in place, and things. So yeah, haven't so been you've accidentally ended up with a leader who's a bit amateurish. But also, we know about his past. He hasn't unequivocally ever stood up and condemned all of this stuff. And we know that he's shared a stage with people from Hezbollah, who have you know, people who endorse the eradication of the Jewish race, and he's described them as friends. So it doesn't send out a great message to other I mean, young not, Labour Party people. That's not party policy again. I mean, I've only just come in. It's less than a year since I've been an MP. I don't know yeah. every part of his history. But, I mean, that is not Labour Party policy, which is agreed at Labour Party conference. As I say, at the moment, I'm a constituency backbench MP. I focus on my job, those things. I think it's very concerning about these allegations in the Labour Party, the people at the top. I can make representations. I'm only a little person. I know. But, I mean, you know, I know, but I'm interested. Right I'm interested that, because um, even as a, as a little person, as you put it, even as a backbench MP, you know, mm, it's relevant yes. the way that your leader conducts himself and manages the party because it all reflects on you, doesn't it? So, you know, all I mean, I'm saying is you must be looking for firmer action right now from the We need to look leadership. for firm action on all types of anti-racism. Mm. So we need to fight racism wherever it is. We can't tolerate anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Mm. Um, and you would like... The other you Islamophobia, would like gender, discrimination... That needs to come down Disability, from discrimination, all of those things. In all cases, we need to be yeah, no, but listen, like, on. And listen, it's incumbent on all of us to do our bit as well. There's 232 Labour MPs. That's right, MPs, but you're so all looking to... You can do as much as you want, but the Labour Party's still going to have a bad reputation if the leader's not doing as much as, for instance, you might be. Get him on next week. Well, Who's on next listen, week? We would love to have him Go on. on. We would love, on. as long as he doesn't come on, we can only speak to his hard-working backbench you know, MPs I'm not his like master's that. voice, if you know what I mean. I know. But you, I am, you don't answer my job title him, is to but, represent the you, people in Ealing and Acton. But also the Labour Party, because you didn't run an independent ticket, did you? You ran as a Labour Party candidate. So I'm just asking you about the way that your party is perceived right now. I mean, I'm, I I mean, the thing is, I knock you. on lots of doors. I'll be doing it again tomorrow. Yeah. And um, so I, I, uh, it'll be interesting to see this week what comes up. OK. Well, thanks to my special guest, Rupa Huck MP, information correct at time of recording, and to my panel, Alfie Moore, Aisha Hazarika and Simon Evans. Good night, everyone.